It's called the Didache. It was published in 134 A.D. It was the first teaching of the post-apostolic fathers on the doctrines of the church. Written by an overwhelmingly Gentile church to an overwhelmingly Gentile population in the Roman Empire. And it says, the killing of life in the womb is murder most foul and is to not be countenanced among those who would name the name of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And in the first century A.D., abortion and infanticide were common in Rome. In fact, Will and Ariel Duran in their history of Western civilization say that in about 100 A.D., that 99 out of every 100 girl babies were killed after the first girl baby was safely born into a family. They would just kill the girl babies after they were born. When the Christian faith became the dominant faith in the Roman Empire by the end of the 4th century, abortion and infanticide stopped. And they remained beyond the pale for civilized society until the fall of the Christian consensus in the West. First in the Soviet Union and then in the Third Reich and then in the 1960s and the 1970s in North America. We are involved in fighting God's fight and we're on the right side. And I want to say to you tonight, we're winning. Do not, do not grow weary in your labors because we are winning the battle for hearts and minds. The Gallup poll shows now for the first time since they started polling the question 20 years ago, the majority of Americans describe themselves as pro-life. Pro-life is the new normal. And let's remember that the Achilles heel of the pro-abortion, pro liberal, moral, relativist movement, and those are redundancies, but liberalism is morally relative, is that pro-abortion, liberal, moral relativism produces catastrophically low birth rates. Since 1973, pro-life parents have been having their babies and they've been raising them to be pro-life. Pro-abortion parents have often not had their babies and so they haven't raised them to be anything. And that is why, in spite of the best efforts of the popular culture, in spite of the best efforts of sex education in the schools, in spite of the best efforts of Planned Parenthood, the most pro-life demographic in America are those Americans who are 37 and younger because they've been disproportionately raised by pro-life parents. Now, this begins to show up. You know, if the most pro-life demographic in the country is 37 and younger, only half of them can vote yet. Guess what happens when the other half can vote? I was privileged to be in Houston at the protest of the largest abortion clinic outside of China.
So I looked out across that crowd. I looked at the future of the pro-life movement. 14,000 people were gathered there. The crowd estimates were that it was about 80% under 30, about 40% Anglo, 30% Hispanic, 30% African American. And in Spanish and English, they were carrying signs that said, we survived Roe, Roe won't survive us. Brothers and sisters, we're one vote away from putting Roe v. Wade on the ash heap of history. We got four Supreme Court justices who are itching to overturn Roe. They just need one more. And Roe is on the ash heap of history. I believe that if I live out a normal lifespan, I will live to see... Roe v. Wade put on the ash heap of history along with Dred Scott and along with Plessy v. Ferguson as among the most spectacularly terrible and destructive Supreme Court decisions in American history. Now, when I talk about this catastrophically low birth rates, let me explain what I mean to you. In addition to being pro-life, there was a long article written in 2000 that showed that Roe v. Wade cost Al Gore the 2000 election. There were 9 million babies that were aborted to pro-abortion parents between 1973 and 1982 that would have been eligible to vote for Al Gore in 2000 except they were dead. George W. Bush in 2004 carried the 25 states with the highest birth rate. John Kerry carried the 18 states with the lowest birth rate. The average difference in birth rate between a Bush state and a Kerry state was 12%. Now, I, can you guess what state had the highest birth rate? Utah. <laughs> Vermont had the lowest birth rate. And as a result of this, after the 2000 election, the states that Bush carried gained seven electoral votes after the census, and the states that Gore carried lost seven. If current trends continue, the states that Bush carried in 2004 are going to gain nine electoral votes. Three or four of those are going to be in Texas. And the states that carry carry it are going to lose nine electoral votes. That's 16 electoral votes in two censuses. That's in Ohio. <laughs> and there is a 41% gap in fertility between people who describe themselves as social conservatives and who go to church and people who describe themselves as social liberals and don't go to church. 41% is an Achilles heel that will bury you over a generation. I want to thank all of you who have been involved and who continue to be involved, and I want you to know you never know what kind of influence you're going to have. When I go and speak at pro-life rallies, they're getting younger and younger all the time, not just because I'm getting older and older, but because they're getting younger and younger. But I heard, I heard a story yesterday that inspired me. Some of you know the story of John Quincy Adams. Now, let me tell you, I am a sixth generation Texan. But that's on my father's side. My father's family came to Texas in 1834. My mother is from Boston, which makes me bicultural. And I don't know of any two places that are more proud of their heritage than Texas and Massachusetts. And so when my dad was telling me about Davy Crockett and the Alamo, my mother was telling me about Paul Revere and the Lexington and Concord Minutemen. 